We'll stop talking. And then in a couple of seconds, I'm going to open the floodgates. And I think it's really nice to uh, just welcome people. I know that Betty knows a, almost everybody, it seems. No. <laughs> okay, I'm going to hit admit all. Good evening. Good evening. Danny, I like your picture. I'm not quite sure what your what and those look like hard hats. Helmet hats that you might wear at a perhaps a either a construction site or a geological exposition, exposition, whatever. Going in when you're going to go spelunking. And uh, if you wanted to unmute, you could tell us what those hats are really quickly. Denny Stevens, are you there? Denny? <laughs> Maybe he's not. I'd love to know what those hats are. They look like construction or what you would wear if you're going caving. I don't think they're bike helmets. Good evening, Erin. I remember you from weeks previous. Erin Crotal, thank you for coming again. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. All of you are invited to also open up your um, video so we can see you. Ayubami Oladepo, I have a feeling I, I, I either have another friend by that name or we know each other, which would be really interesting. And you can let me know if it's, you're the person. Hi, Jim and Carol. How are you? It's wonderful to see you again. It is always a delight to see you. We will, I am sure. Hi, Erin, you turned on your camera. Thank you. We will have some kind of a live event, at least one next year. I think that's will be in order. Um, either the remain year, this year or next year, and it, it would be fun for as many of you to come as possible. Last week we had somebody from Pennsylvania. Is anybody here this evening who's from a state other than Indiana or Central Indiana? I think we had somebody from New Mexico last time as well. Oh. I I'm from New Mexico, Lois Meyer. Yeah, Lois, thank you. I'm glad to see you again. Now, Hello, I'm Anne from Denver, Colorado. Hi, Anne. Okay, well, you are, you've got to tell us, Lois and Anne, how you heard about us. I got an email. I do world affairs things and uh, great decisions here in Denver. And I got an email from you and I wanted to listen to your version of this presentation. Yep. Okay. And I'm Nils from uh, Palm Desert, California. Well, okay. And Niels, how did you hear about us? The same way. I'm a member of the World Affairs Council of the Desert, and we got an email from them that uh, we could join in with you. And Lois, how about you? Sort of the same story. Um, and I've, I've joined in on several of your talks oh. and really, really appreciate them. Thank you so much. Now, do you all do yours the same way we do in terms of having somebody actually speak to the topic and then we do a, a Q and A or you do you uh, look at the uh, DVD and discuss from the book? How do you do yours? I'll go first. Yeah. I'll, I'll go first. We seldom look at the DVD. Somebody's in charge per topic. I am on again in a couple of weeks for Iran, for example. And I have my case a partner because I'm just coming off knee surgery, need a little help. And uh, she and I will make a presentation, adding things to what the reading is. Some groups I've been in use the text information more than others. I, I like it to use it some. Why bother to have people read it if you're never going to make any reference to it? Mm -hmm. But uh, we do kind of a balance between some of the questions there, our own questions, but one, one member each time sort of leads the discussion. That's the Denver way to do it. Okay. 
And does anybody who's uh, who I'm talking about, because there's other people entering, so I've sort of lost you on the page here. Do you have speakers like we do? Yes. No. In the speakers? desert, we have speakers. Okay. Uh, dinner speakers come in and uh, they're very informative. Okay, great. And Anne, you do not? Oh, uh, you said? Uh, generally, but mine is done through League of Women Voters here. So mm -hmm. um, generally, we don't have a speaker too. When I've done it with uh, things with our World Affairs Council here in Denver, then we, we use a lot of speakers. Okay. Lois, how about you? Well, um, as as far as great decisions goes, we don't have speakers. Um, I participated for about three years, and I don't want to put a blanket on the party, but I have stopped participating in that here because I didn't find the diversity of views that I would have liked, and uh -huh. I was I was frustrated that the folks who write the booklet all come from a U.S. foreign policy perspective and rarely uh, illuminate the voices from the regions that they are talking about. And as someone who travels a lot internationally, that really made me unhappy. But the World Affairs Council here does bring in speakers. <clears throat> Okay, I know I need to go to the program. This is really interesting, you know, and I think um, for those people who are who are curious as to why I'm asking the questions, um, this is how we sort of grow and learn. We, I, I've always said we are a little bit different. Uh, our great decisions is associated, is a part of the Indiana Council of World Affairs. You, you are almost talking about like the council sort of separate from great decisions. And for, I think, a lot of places, you can simply do a great yeah. decision. We've got places here in Indiana, several places, that will simply provide a great decisions program, but are not at all associated with a world council. And we are the Indiana Council on World Affairs and Great Decisions is one of our two programs. One being the great decisions and the other being distinguished speakers. And then our third program is uh, Academic World Quest. Mm -hmm. And we're extremely pleased and this is pretty much how we have functioned now for several decades. And we don't want to be the same old, same old. And um, and we really probably won't change that up too much because people have come to count on it. Uh, I like the way we do our great decisions, which has, or I think, a very long time and is uh, bring in a speaker that's identified um, as uh, bringing some authority and expertise uh, with that topic. Uh, and then, um, and then we have half of the program, as, you, as those of you who know the format, a robust Q&A, which gives the audience the opportunity to do the type of engagement they would to do if they were participating in like a lot of great decisions around the country. And that's extremely important, not just a lecturing to people. We want people to be engaged with the discussion. And of course, people talk about the book. Many of you know that there is a excellent journal that comes with this. And I think criticisms of it are totally fair. I mean, I think it's important that the councils and, and the Foreign Policy Association hear the feedback say, you need to have our views and- or type of speakers, yeah. Aim it the other way. Pardon me, Oh, I, I was just gonna refer to, we, we have some very good speakers coming in to a Desert Council. And uh, just last night, we had Gordon Chang who is an authority on, on China. He was speaking to us and we had a very good Q&A session. So that's very informative, yeah. It is, it is great. This is the place for people who are hungry for global conversations who might not get it otherwise in their community. Uh, this is really um, the place to go to it. And, 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 and we, our council can visit your councils and I think we should. Thank you so much. Uh, you are at the Indiana Council of World Affairs. Uh, welcome, thank you. And you are at, um, well, you're the second to last. I, I want to just tell you that this evening is great decisions. Um, I want to bring this up in the front of the beginning. Ray, who is our board president, said, well, people tend to leave before we say goodbye at the very end. We want to tell you that we're coming very close to the end of our program year. And so tonight we are going to be talking about global famine, Next week will be our final program for distinguished speakers. Uh, it will be on Ireland. Ireland has been in the news again about the Irish Accord. And I don't think that that war is going to erupt again between Northern Ireland and the Republic. 
but um, the countries have needed assurances that the conditions by which the peace accord brought, which includes literally an invisible border um, and the ease by which the people can traverse back and forth um, are respected, but so are the differences between the two. Republic is a part of the European Union. Uh, it is not a part of Brexit at all, where the Northern Ireland is. And that will be discussed next week, and that'll be really interesting. And then in two weeks will be our final program for great decisions, and that'll be on economic warfare. But just to let you know that you have this week and then two more sessions, and then that will be the end of our program year. Um, but please stay tuned because we're already planning what we can do this summer to invite and bring you together um, so we can stay in touch and maybe even something that will be actually more for central Indiana. We're looking at the possibility of maybe a, a wine tasting or what have you to, to bring people together. Uh, and then we will plan for our program year next year. And that takes some time. But um, I want to say that this evening's program on Global Famine, I'm quite excited about our speaker this evening. Um, she and I are in the same community. We've had you all over the world. This, this year, last year, that's what Zoom has done. It has allowed us to take the topics that are talking about the world and bring in speakers from anywhere we'd like to have them come from because virtual programs allow us to do that. But this evening, we have somebody from Purdue University, and I'm sitting in Lafayette, and she's right across the river in West Lafayette. We understand, we know Purdue University for being an outstanding uh, leading university in uh, science and technology and agriculture. Uh, it is a cradle of astronauts. Uh, dozens of astronauts have come out of Purdue University's educational system, BA, MA, and PhDs. That includes Neil Armstrong, first man who walked to the moon, Gus Grissom, untold number of other astronauts. If you didn't know this, I will I'll be here to tell you that it's also the home of Orville Redenbacher. Uh, if you like Orville Redenbacher's popcorn, well, he came to Purdue University. And, um, but Purdue University is just more than just th that growing better corn for better popcorn. Um, they're taking their expertise in technology and in agricultural science and making an impact on a hungry world, uh, a global famine. And um, I am excited about this evening's program when I heard that we found a speaker from Purdue and the kind of initiatives that they have taken to do this. I thought, you know, they're a leading university in the world for a reason. And uh, their 20% of the students are, are, are from other parts of the world. I, uh, for those of us who have lived and traveled around the world, uh, we run into, I run into people all the time. Oh, I got my degree at Purdue University. I got my pharmacology degree. And uh, so since here in the Midwest uh, is this fantastic powerhouse of university making a difference. And Diane Fair, will you please introduce our speaker? Thank you, Betty. Uh, Sylvia Bruder is the director of the Purdue Center for Global Food Security and a Wickersham Chair of Excellence in Agricultural Research. The research's mission is to elevate the global food and nutrition security agenda and to engage with our varied partners in meeting the UN sustain Sustainable Development Goals of Eliminating Hunger and Nutrition Insecurity by 2030 while conserving the natural resource base. Dr. Bruder graduated from Harvard University with a BA in biology and the University of California Davis with a degree with a PhD in ecology. She studies agricultural productivity and agriculture's impact on the environment in a changing climate and oversees research activities at the Water Quality Field Station, an infield laboratory and Purdue University core facility. Um, see. <laughs> I just lost my, um, okay. With expertise in soil health and climate smart agriculture, she works with various organizations and partners to develop, implement and access public investment in science and capacity development. She has conducted in-depth reviews of the consultative group for international agricultural research programs for the food and agriculture organizations. And with Purdue colleagues, she has designed graduate 
curriculum for a world bank funded African Center of Excellence in Climate Smart Agriculture. Dr. Brudera recently served as president for the American Society of Agronomy, where she advanced an array of initiatives to increase um, the rate of translation of science into guidance for policymakers and evidence-based practices. She currently, she is currently serving a second term on the Standing Science Advisory Board for U.S. Environmental Protection Agency to provide expertise in ecology, climate change, and agriculture. She is a fellow of ASA and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Brudere. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. That's way too long of an introduction. And <laughs> I know. I was thinking about cutting some of it. Like, wait. <laughs> Just cut it at the name, and that's probably good enough. <laughs> um, I have a few brief comments to get started and uh, then I think we'll just have a conversation that encompasses issues in in the reading. So I am going to share my screen right now. Uh, here we go. All right. Can you all see my screen? Okay. All right. Thank you very much. It's a it's a pleasure to be here um, on behalf of both Purdue University, but especially the Purdue Center for Global Food Security and Executive Director Gabisa Ajeda. Um, if you had to to meet the the desire for someone who can speak from the heart about in country experiences, well, that would be Dr. Ajeda, uh, who is spread fairly thin, and some of you may have heard of him. If not, I will let you know who he is in one second. But um, anyway, on his behalf and on the center's behalf, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, all right, little slides. Let's go advance. Hmm. Well, my slides don't want to advance. Come on. Oh, there they go. Um, so just as a little bit of background, I, I mentioned that I'm an ecologist and I'm most definitely a, an ecologist. I study biological systems, including systems that have humans in them. Um, but I do spend most of my time thinking about plants and how they grow and primarily about crop plants. But um, when I was getting my degrees and deciding what I wanted to do with myself, um, the um, notion of food limitations and hunger for humans and that kind of thing was really linked to this notion in, in, the, in the classroom, et cetera, of um, the Earth's carrying capacity being finite in that, you know, there were, there were only so many organisms the world could uh, uh, support, the globe could support, and that when we got to a certain population number of humans, what would happen to us is what happens to other biological species, and that's usually that the, the numbers get knocked back either because of starvation or uh, disease or disaster or things like that, and that we would then cycle along, around a certain number that the Earth could support. Um, there was some discussion about if we really overshot the carrying capacity because we were so busy growing the, the, the human population that the population itself might do irreparable harm and then we would either crash completely and die out, which has happened to species in the past, they've gone extinct, um, or we might um, be uh, restricted to a lower carrying capacity because we had been damaged, we had done damage to our planet. Um, I think we have a much more nuanced framing now when we think about population numbers and, and it's not just so focused on population numbers themselves, but where people are and what they have access to. And this has sort of been in a very academic way, we always want to make a diagram, has been ingested into this um, 
concept and diagram of what some are calling planetary boundaries, where instead of thinking just about what the world could support in terms of the resources, we think more about specific resources and how we're degrading them and then where we may be going beyond what ecologists like to call tipping points where there would be no return in terms of the function of the planet or the population of species, et cetera. And you can see in this little diagram, things that are highlighted have to do with biodiversity loss, um, which is very important for sustaining our populations. We are, rely on a lot of the biodiversity that's out there to uh, give us many of the things we consume, but then also areas like climate change or the areas I work in, which are um, related to nutrients and, and excess or finite resources of things like phosphorus to grow plants. Um, so that's a little bit more of a, you know, kind of the, the overall sort of uh, deep science framing that some have out there. This comes out of Europe, a, a think tank on biodiversity um, in Europe. Um, just in terms of the, the Purdue Center for Global Food Security and its own history, we um, really got launched in 2010 when we had the opportunity um, that it was in the wake of the, the, the food crisis and, and price crisis hike. And we had the opportunity to collect people here on campus um, and to do some visioning and to discuss the emerging global challenges of food and nutrition security. So not just famine per se, but the pathway to famines, which um, go through food and nutritional insecurity, um, and also, you know, just general instability and poverty, they tend to, to go through those pathways. And this was placed in what was built then by Martin Ziske, um, president at the time, who had this vision for what he called Discovery Park, which was where um, he would create a physical space for convening people across sciences to talk about big things. At the time, we also happened to have some great convening power. Um, and that is that we had three world food, well, at the time it was only two world food prize winners. So this is the, the Norman Borlaug food prize, which was created because there was no Nobel prize in agriculture and he was given the peace prize. Um, but he turned around and said, we need, we need to recognize the efforts of individuals or groups contributing to um, the advancement of the human condition via agriculture. And so if you don't know who these individuals are, um, we have Dr. Phil Nelson, who was the chair, uh, head of the Department of Food Science, and it, he won in 2007. And his contribution was for a technology many of us take advantage of every day, and that's for fresh fruit transport and things like orange juice or tomatoes or whatever without spoilage. And what we see in our fridge, much of it has experienced the benefit of that technology. But then you also, that technology was extended to food storage um, for smallholders in Africa, primarily is where the big emphasis has been for aseptic storage of grain to prevent spoilage and death from an array of um, diseases associated with consuming spoiled food. Um, Gabisa Jetta, the executive director of the center, won in 2009, and he developed, um, he's standing in the middle of a sorghum field, which without, um, without an ear um, and, or a head on the grain looks quite a lot like corn, but it was, has been and probably will be grown um, uh, again around here. But in Africa, it is um, parasitized by a beautiful flower called striga. And he developed um, uh, new varieties of, of sorghum that were resistant to both drought and striga. And then we have Akeem Adesino, who is a, an alum um, of ours. And he, um, he he's known for an array of financing innovations, uh, many of which serve to reduce corruption in Africa and increase uh, um, credit avail availability to smallholder African farmers. Um, okay, so 
we came to being because there was concern about the emerging global challenges. And these did include population growth, but also with climate change, it was rapid land use and dietary changes, and it was growing inequities in income and access to resources. Um, and when we were launched, we were really pretty optimistic that um, we could harness a transdisciplinary approach, bring all the great minds together to be transformative in tempering these stresses and accelerate the pace of elimination of hung hunger um, and nutrition insecurity to meet the sustainability development goals of zero hunger by 2030. Um, unfortunately, a decade later, um, we really um, we were declining up until about 2010. But what you're looking at in that graph is the percentage in hunger, and it really flattens out in 2011 and 2012. And now it is even on the increase. This comes from um, the Food and Agricultural's a food and agriculture organizations report on um, the status of hunger and malnutrition. Um, one of the interesting little tidbits in there that I think is important to, to leverage up is, or to, to surface up is that when you look at the, the continents, we know you can see Africa, you, you look at the total population and what's striking about Africa is that the percentage, that red dot that exp are experiencing severe food in insecurity is a much larger overall percentage then, for example, obviously in Europe and North America, which is right next to it, where you see um, of the total population, the percentage that is experiencing the stress is much lower. Nonetheless, it is still there. And then you have places like Asia with huge populations and a large number um, in severe food insecurity, but still a lar large number not, and therefore quite a lot of wealth in, in, in the region, presumably available to raise people out of that current circumstance if that were desired. Um, the other thing that I think is important to mention is that we often think of um, um, famine and um, uh, definitely famine, but also to a lesser extent, um, the food insecurity as being a rural international problem. But indeed, there's food insecurity, as I'm sure you all know, domestically in both urban and rural environments. And then internationally, certainly urban um, environments, there, there is also famine or, and definitely you know, periods of famine, it's easier to perhaps get to where there's infrastructure, um, but definitely um, food insecurity in urban environments. Um, the final point I'll make is that the context have, been, have changed a bit too. We talk about, well, it's just population growth. Now there's a much uh, more uh, robust consensus amongst anybody who is talking about things and thinking about policies and science that climate is a huge climate and climate change is a huge trigger and can um, plunge people. So you have climate change up here. Um, it can produce system shocks all on its own, and it can shock other sectors. And these shocks then propagate through the system, through food, food systems, leading to sp um, spikes in, in volatility and prices that then have feedbacks. Um, that eventually result in negative impacts on agricultural lands. Maybe you get agricultural expansion to poor lands and you get increased um, greenhouse gas emissions, which feed back into more uh, uh, changing climate. So one of the targets has become um, simply focusing on what are the pathways to building resiliency to climate shocks and even to the local prevailing social conditions. Um, how do you build resiliencies, resilience in people on the ground so that they have a better opportunity to survive in times where you have a climate shock or you have conflict come in or you have a disease shock like COVID, building in that resiliency. So um, switching to the US government, their food security research strategy, they're focused also now, this came out in uh, late um, 2022 and it's for 2022 to 2026, it's an all of government. It's about convergence 
research where you're bringing all the disciplines together, which is what we did try to do. Um, and you're trying to um, harness all of the sciences and all of our knowledge to think about how do we expand access not just to food, but to food systems, and that means markets and trade. Um, and their themes are climate smart agricultural research. That's the, the area or innovation, that's the area in which I work, nutrition and food systems. Um, and then genetic improvement of crops and livestock to be more resilient to the, to the environments where we want to have them. Um, and this aligns really well with Purdue's research agenda at the center, which is really about um, discovery, development, and deployment of new technologies to achieve the climate resilience programs to enhance relationships. Um, uh, we think partnerships and relationships are very, very important between ag and the food, food and nutrition experts and health um, to overall improve the global food systems and then programs to harmonize our global food um, and ag systems with climate change. And those are just a couple photos of of the systems in Africa where we've done some climate smart work, you can see that the, the groundwater levels have really been drawn down and people are digging these major pits to try to access irrigation water. So um, the, those are the types of projects we are interested in and the capacity in country that we're working to develop. And I'm gonna leave it at that and stop sharing. And- uh, Yes, I'm gonna jump in here. Okay, uh, okay. Yeah. Thank you, Sylvie. Um, so I, I, we, we talked earlier, and so um, we're going to have a little bit of a conversation here about some, some of the issues that Sylvia has brought up already and, and maybe some additional topics. Uh, if you personally have a question, uh, you can address it to me, Ray Montagno, and send it in the chat. And when we're done with our little conversation, I will call on uh, folks to kind of answer, ask their questions uh, as we go along here. So um, you, you kind of talked about what Purdue is doing. Uh, could you maybe give a, a specific example of a project and, you know, how that played out at, from Purdue? Sure. Um, and it's one we're actually still involved with, which has had a COVID pause. And so it, it's been challenging. But we um, we had a, a project um, uh, in um, in in the e in East Africa, in Ethiopia, with uh, where they were a center for um, an African center for excellence funded by the World Bank, and it was focused on climate smart agriculture. And our goal was, as is with many things, was to um, both help facilitate the research, the research and the technology innovation that needed to be done in that area to promote resiliency, but also to develop the cur curricula for the in-country capacity development so that they, the, the, the faculties and the students um, could be using a shared model. And, and um, Dr. Ajeta is very passionate, as am I, about the land-grant model where you know, our, our mission has always been to develop public goods and services. And this includes not just research products, but um, education, products and educational um, innovations for both classrooms and non-traditional settings. And we have tried to always, that was a, um, uh, you know, multiple disciplines were involved, people who work in the area of biodiversity, because that's a, an area of great loss of biodiversity, people who work in the social sciences and understand that just because you have a technology um, it doesn't mean it's good off the shelf. It often has to be um, adapted to the local communities before they will consider adopting it. So it has to be made context appropriate. And so that's one of, one of the things that the, the team was doing. Um, we also try to work collaboratively with other entities on campus who are doing really interesting things across the space that includes energy and national security. All right, very good. Uh, you you were alluding to um, climate change, and uh, I was I don't know how many of you actually read the the, uh, the briefing book, but the author didn't really talk about climate change very much in the book, and I was a little surprised about that. And I was looking at as I kind of looked at the map, and I was looking at sort of countries around the equator. Is this 
is climate change going to kind of affect more of a specific geography or is this going to spread to other regions of the world as, as we go move forward here in the, in the future? Well, I think it's that was actually a very interesting question because um, from a global perspective, climate change is globally destabilizing. Um, but the, there are very definitely, um, at least in the moment, winners and losers. So there actually are some places that may do better or, um, and so if you think even of the US, um, there was a recent analysis done about um, corn in Nebraska that actually showed that the um, moderating of the winters and the fall spring in Nebraska has made a more favorable climate in which to grow corn, provided you have your irrigation water. Um, nonetheless, um, in general, hot places will get hotter and moisture regimes will change um, or are changing. Some are becoming wetter, some are becoming drier. Um, and the intensity and duration of extreme events um, it is expected to increase. And we've already seen some of that, you know, with, for example, hurricanes or even, uh, what was it, last week with the flood, flooding in Florida where we had a one in a thousand year uh, flood event. I'm pretty sure we're going to have another one before I die, and I'm not planning on living that long. I mean, these, these things are happening with increasing frequency. Um, I think with respect to the, to the regions you've identified, um, you know, those regions where climate change is already or is expected to be very impactful, they share commonalities in terms of non-climate stressors. And so some of those um, non, uh, uh, some of those non-climate stressors, those commonalities are that the, the land and the farming, it's occupied by, it's done by smallholder farmers, so subsistence farmers, where um, property rights tend to be much less secure and they may be ill-defined and, and lands are being um, fragmented into little bits and pieces. There's environmental degradation. It's important to note that many of those regions already have, they have older soils. So these soils are what we call more weathered. And so they are more nutrient poor naturally. And they take some stewardship to produce crops on. Typically, yields are lower to start out with, and there was a higher le level of risk. Um, and then there are a bunch of other things that get thrown into the mix, and they include things like protectionist ag policies in developed countries, things like um, diseases, HIV, AIDS, which reduces, which has reduced um the, the the labor on farm but then also threats of um pan, pan zodics, avian influenza and things like that um and so these things they disrupt knowledge translation they constrain trade uh they reduce labor and you're already in um and then you have uh state or um government entities that are are, are fragile and are already actively in conflict um and so you know, environmentally and um, socioeconomically in a harsh environment to start out with. And now you add climate change. And so if you think of something like pastoralism, that's an, an, already an adaptation to a harsh environment. Um, um, you've got high spatiotemporal variability in rainfall. And so the strategy was mobility. You just follow around the resources. But if the resources suddenly become more scarce and you have more, more people or rain is more sporadic, um, the livelihoods can very rapidly become untenable. And so if you think about the environments that are particularly vulnerable, those are semi-arid mixed rainfall sort of crop livestock systems like the Sahel, Sahel arid semi-arid grazing systems, maybe in East Africa, and then highland perennial systems. And um, if you've heard any little murmurs about things like coffee, those are the systems that are going to be extremely heavily impacted by climate change. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we all, obviously we're seeing that in the United States with the um, Southwest has experienced um, years of drought and so forth. So, uh, so, 
So one possible solution here, and I'm gonna, this is kind of a controversial issue, is GMO foods. Um, I had a speaker in one of my classes a couple of years ago. It was a GMO food uh, engineer. And he said, you know, people call them Franken foods and, uh -huh. you know, the terms. So the, so what, what is the future for GMO foods? Is this going to save uh, thousands, millions of lives? Or is this really a, uh, a threat to our, our food systems? Well, so, you know, for, for, for someone who's, um, who's starving, that's a really... Um, uh, sort of non-relevant, right? At our at discussion, right? If you're starving, you're starving. But from a from a, a stewardship concept, it's complex, right? I mean, so just to be clear, um, from my non-geneticist point of view, that would be Dr. Ajeta Gabisa is a is a plant breeder, but he's more of a traditional crop breeder. And so when you think about um, um, modifying the the phenotype, what 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 a plant looks like, what it does for you. Um, we've always been doing that. Think back to your biology class. You can think about Gregor Mendel fiddling with his peas to get his peas to cross. And then you think about the things we've done to improve crops, to get um, maize to be high yielding or corn to be high yielding um, in the environments in which we grow it. Um, these have been um, the, the products of... Um, you know, genetic manipulation done by humans. So you might want to call it social engineering, maybe because we have socially engineered the plants for the traits we like. Um, the the things with with GMOs is that moved it into the this realm of biotech, where suddenly you were using biotech tools to not wait for Mother Nature to take its course and see what happened when you cross this with that, but to actively go in and snip and cut and modify and insert pieces of genetic material. And um, I think that's where um, uh, some people uh, have really, um, and, and it was a, um, if you think back to pioneer seeds with pioneer corn in the US, they were very dismissive of societal concerns when they rolled this, when they rolled out things like um, um, their, well, their GMO, their Roundup Ready, where you could spray the corn with Roundup because it had a gene in it inserted from another organism that it allowed it to be resistant. And the the um, it, it comes under the concerns of the of the slippery slope, right? If we do that here, where else will we do that? And where do we stop? Um, if you had just taken corn and continued to grow it over and over and over again, and every year you sprayed it with Roundup, eventually you would probably get Roundup resistant corn, just the way you're getting Roundup resistant weeds right now because of natural selection. Um, so it isn't necessarily things that would never happen. It's things that won't, aren't, are extremely unlikely to happen fast that we can now do very quickly with this gene, um, with this gene modification technology. And more recently, there's this um, uh, uh, very precise gene editing method out there that's called CRISPR, which really allows a researcher to remove or insert DNA at a desired location of, of a genome and change things, change baby's eyes from brown to blue, that kind of thing, not just modify a crop to be resistant to striga or to tolerate drought more. And so I think that there's... Um, you know, uh, there is definitely a role for GMO technologies in in even using the the native germplasm of a harsh environment. So you could pick a country in Africa where you could go and collect seeds from from native germplasms that don't yield very much, um, but they have uh, traits that allow them to withstand that harsh environment. And you could use these tools to go pluck out those traits and insert them into higher yielding stuff and in theory produce a crop better adapted very quickly for that environment. 
So there is a benefit, but then there is this concern that you, you know, I, I think it's a very valid ethical discussion of trying to understand where do we stop and what should be permissible and what should not. I mean, this is a case where human ingenuity has figured out yet again how to modify things around it. Uh, and now it creates a very quick pathway and medicine is full of ethical discussions on what we should be doing there. Mm -hmm. So it has advantages. Some countries have banned them. Some countries who have banned them have people who are starving. <laughs> so it's a very. Yeah. It's an inter interesting, difficult question. And, it's you know, very difficult you know, and there's a lot question. Of, a lot of people have very strong opinions about it, and some of which are maybe not scientifically based, but anyhow. And um, I think that there are questions that, that societies, um, the science can say what, what happens and what it does, and then societies do have to make the decision on what they want to do with that capability. Yeah. It's not a science decision necessarily, it's a societal decision. Yeah, kind of change the uh, direction here a little bit, talk about uh, policies and, and famine and responses to famine. Uh, one of the, I thought, very interesting things in the reading was a suggestion that giving cash to <laughs> people who are experiencing famine as opposed to sending them food might be a better strategy. Um, what What is your thoughts on that? What are the kind of advantages and disadvantages of that approach? So, so you know, I think this is a, definitely um, uh, something we we um, are not necessarily deliberate about. We because from a from a perspective of a donor, we often think about what's convenient versus what's what has the highest efficacy. So, you know, even even in country. When you have a disaster, everybody wants to enter, empty their closet and send their, you know, hand-me-downs to someplace else. And the donor organizations are like, please, the most useful thing you can do right now is send us cash, because then we can turn that into what is actually needed on the ground. Um, I think that, you know, taking a step back outside of, you know, extreme conflict situations, it, it, just from the from the perspective of the activity of farming, farming is a risky business, and so um, if if we are at a regional or even a global scale, um, aiming for ensuring sufficiency, we're probably actually shooting for some overproduction because we know there's risk. And this is at all scales, whether it's the individual farm scale or the regional scale or whatever. And so there's a, 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 a tendency that we're, well, the, the outcome is that where production conditions are good, um, we're going to be producing enough to share plus a little bit more. And then the question becomes, okay, well, can we put, how do we put that to its best use, um, especially if we have humanitarian issues in, in mind? Um, we have, uh, you know, as our populations have grown, our technologies and our systems for food have grown and we now have what we would consider a global food system where I'm getting my, I had an artichoke for dinner, it did not come from Indiana. I am consuming foods produced from all over the world at my dinner table, and we can debate which ones I should and shouldn't be eating. In exchange for that, I do something else in the economy, and I do not gain income from farming myself. And so um, we are in a global food system, and we do have this surplus. In an ideal world, I mean, I think most, most farmers in developed countries and in, even in a development country are actually linked to global agricultural and food systems. It's amazing in Ethiopia how many people, for better or worse, are growing what's called chat to sell um, it, um, in the Middle East. It's a it's a it's a, a, a drug. Um, it's a plant with a drug in it that you chew and it suppresses hunger. Um, and instead of sorghum, because they get paid more. And so um, most, most farmers, wherever they are, are, some, are, are linked somewhat. In an ideal world, when you get to a crisis point, um, one would hope that 
in the absence of conflict, the crisis, the assessment of what to do would be based on not who has supply, but how do you most efficiently meet the need given supplies? Hungry people need food and starving people need food right away. They don't necessarily need just corn from California or just wheat from Ukraine, but that may be a large part of their initial staple diet. Eventually, they will need other things like proteins uh, and uh, especially children and infants need protein. And so monetary payments for uh, specific food supplements may actually be needed uh, much more than trying to move a massive amount of a crop from the center of a continent to completely to the other side of the world. Um, in less acute crises, I think dollars may be more um, effective in general to allow people um, to purchase not just food, but the critical inputs, fertilizers, improved seed or whatever, to, to stabilize markets and get them to a more stable livelihood um, that lays the foundation for resiliency and supports the market creation, et cetera, and development of purchasing power, that kind of thing. The problem with money, of course, is that um, it is um, much more subject to um, uh, co corruptive forces along the way, influencing whether it ever arrives at its desired destination. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that in that article, it talked about vouchers and things like that, but certainly it takes about, um, I don't know how long to, to identify a voucher backed by a dollar or euro and monetize that on the black market for dollars and euros. So, the, you know, I think the, the, um, uh, the issues of what are the best ways to go, you can, you can only, you know, the, um, science, technology and innovation um, coupled with, you know, sort of fair and equitable trade and development of, of market opportunities, um, you know, so are, are the pathway out of the cyclical crises. In the cyclical crises, um, I think it, it requires that pragmatic analysis of what is best, because if you've got food and you can move it in time to meet the need, then move the food. Uh, if that's not going to do it, and money is needed to get the food from someplace else, do money. Mm -hmm. No, it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, when I read that, I was like, oh, that's that's an interesting idea. And it sort of reminded me of this movement for the live, living wage idea. Yeah. You know, it's sort of the same kind of concept, you know, give people money and they figure things out on their own. But, you know, it does have all that corruption background associated with it as well. Well, and that's why in a in a in a well-meaning, well-intended, and um, uh, I don't know whatever you want to say on the ground approach, where where everyone is is pulling together in the same direction, you're okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, just a reminder: if you have a question for Sylvie, please send it to me in the chat, and I'll I'm going to ask one more question of her, and then we'll kind of move on to the uh, to the. Uh, audience and participant uh, questions. Uh, so one of the things that's always kind of interested me is you have all of these different agencies doing lots of different things and, <laughs> and hunger and defense and so forth. And, you know, we're all trying to do the same thing. You know, all these agencies and groups are trying to do the same thing, solve, uh, help people to have better lives. Do they talk to each other or they get so siloed in their kind of worldview and what they're doing that they get in each other's way in terms of helping solve problems. You know, what what kind of experience have you had with that or what's your think, thoughts on that? Well, I think, you know, one of the things that the center tries to do is, is try to um, find, identify, and, and build complementary partnerships. Uh, and that that's a combination of understanding what's needed on the ground, what's the best fit on the ground um, uh, to address a problem, what's the best fit with the the issue at hand. But I think absolutely <laughs> agencies are siloed. Um, and sometimes um, 
And so, of course, that can get in the way. And sometimes they're just like confused who's doing what. And, and you all seem to be trying to do the same thing. And I remember thinking when I was um, reviewing programs in India that, um, you know, certainly driving and being driven was a hazard to your health and the greatest hazard to my health might be getting run over, I probably shouldn't say this, by, by a, a white um, uh, SUV emblazoned with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation logo <laughs> because they were everywhere running this one. Then there were all these in-country organizations. And so you can get organizations not talking to each other and working at, um, not necessarily at cross purposes, but um, in ignorance of each other, which at a minimum leads to confusion on the ground of who, who's doing what and, and, and can lead to consequential loss of trust from vulnerable people who are trying to figure out um, where do they put the vestiges of their trust as they are in desperate situations and they, they don't have, they can't spread, you know, spread their eggs into multiple basket. They have one little nugget and have to get and they want to put, place that trust with an organization that has the highest probability of of working for them. You know, I think there's um sometimes when you look at why agencies are are sort of siloed, um some of them have strong ideological underpinnings, which um they just you know, they're going to work on these things and they're going to work this way and they don't necessarily believe that other ways that are being tried are going to be as effective or reach the outcome that's desired. Um, and that can constrain the collaboration. Um, and, then, and then there are an array of benign reasons, um, including just past experience where somebody's figured out how to do something and goes in and then somebody who hasn't figured it out yet is looking around saying, well, I know how to solve this problem um, and goes at it and tries a different way and uh, the, the outcome is the same. So um, coordination amongst agencies and I think, you know, um, USAID and their uh, agency for in-country development and their their in-country missions. One of the things they try to do is keep entity who's who's where, uh, it, both for for the safety of the people who are coming from the organizations, so that they can deal with you if you get into a troubled agency, who a, a troubling situation, who's there, but also to um, try to um, locally instill order on what's happening as everybody you know people are trying to do good this isn't about people purposefully not trying to be helpful it's just that as with anything not all helpful is as helpful as we would envision it to be yeah. so that kind of made me think of something um, i was in rotary for many years and the um, polio vaccination campaign that rotary in some countries, they ran into local problems, you know, that there was no, no trust by locals. And, mm -hmm. uh, so is that an issue around you know, food as well in terms of getting kind of local people engaged, you know, who's in charge and who has power in these? In these yeah. Companies? You, you absolutely have to understand the, the, the power structures in the communities who who you are supposed to approach to work with you may or may not agree with that um and uh in most cases even if it's a highly experienced organization if they haven't invested in people on the ground in the country with a sufficient length of experience in the country dealing with the individuals you are you are set on your heels from the get-go okay all right, um, so um, I, I think we'll call on a couple of folks now. There's a couple of people out here. Uh, Claire Collins, you have a, a question? Yeah, I've um, heard that bananas are going extinct and I just wondered if they are and what are scientists doing to uh, save the endangered species of fruits and vegetables? Um, I believe 
um, that I have heard about the banana problem as well. And that's disease related. There's several major diseases out there that are impacting um, some of the major fruits and vegetables that we have quite a liking to. And that includes things like citrus greening, which is impacting the citrus crop in the US. Um, much like any, uh, you know, anything. That, so, you know, we, we do these things to improve the crops and that tends to make the, the things we grow more and more genetically uniform and therefore susceptible to the same problem, right? And, and then if you have a high density of production and you don't get on top of a disease quickly, you can literally wipe out large areas and where it's a, a tree, uh, you've got a huge lag between the time you planted that thing and the time you're going to replant something and have a, a fruit, especially sufficient fruit for Chiquita to export. Um, but I, you know, I think I'm, I'm not an expert on the banana, but I have heard about it. I did register and I do know somebody who works on the diseases related to banana. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, Lois Meyer, you got a comment and question, maybe? Okay. Sylvie, I appreciate that you have listed issues, decisions, dilemmas. Just now you mentioned another that go beyond science regarding the use and dangers of GMOs. Uh, but you did not mention the question of who ultimately makes these decisions in a local area. So I do a lot of work with ind indigenous colleagues in Oaxaca, Mexico, all of whom live in rural, marginalized subsist uh, communities that prioritize subsistence farming and defend tenaciously their communal properties. Mm -hmm that they are adamantly against the insertion of GMOs into Oaxaca. And interestingly enough, some major Mexican agronomists are right there fighting with them against GMOs mm -hmm. coming into the native corn crops. So when are these kinds of voices, indigenous voices, when are they listened to? Well, I, you know, that, that, that remains um, something that there's a lot of lip service to, at least now, but perhaps not much um, uh, movement necessarily in, in that, in actual um, engagement and listening and, um, you know, true partnership at the table of decision making. I know that in the past, so from my experiences on the um, the science advisory board for the EPA here in the US, um, the um, approach of 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 trying to um, uh, bring um, marginalized environmental so a whole of government approach to environmental justice and equal access to de decision makers and to the decision making process. In theory, it's been prioritized for discussions uh, like where, you know, uh, how should we handle uh, PFAS, per, the, the forever chemicals that are now contaminating everything because they're a byproduct. So um, th there is interest within the U.S., but then whether, um, whether a, um, a country decides that the, the, the the records are all over the place on on who is allowing and who is not allowing GMO products. Now we 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 export, and I think Mexico just held up our our desire to export GMO uh, uh, soybean to um, to Mexico. Uh, and then there was a lot of heavy discussion, mostly because we want to move crop, but also because there are presumably consequences in Mexico for not receiving our crop, although they could get it from someplace else. So, um, you know, I, I, I have purposely avoided saying who I think should decide other than I don't think it should be the scientist. <laughs> you know, we, we do things, should a scientist never have discovered it? Well, that's, that's hard to 
to say um, because we scientists try things to see what happens and we create tools um, that have the potential to be used and adapted, but it doesn't necessarily mean that their use is appropriate everywhere for everyone. And I do think that has to go back. And so there, there is a lot of discussion amongst um, uh, amongst uh, uh, native communities in the US, indigenous communities throughout the world. There's also a, a large movement to make sure indigenous germplasms are preserved. So the wealth of genetic diversity is preserved. Um, and so that's a, a plus. Um, but then, and, and a desire to understand what's in that germplasm, but then how to use it and where these technologies sit is um, a much debated question. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, personally, I'm kind of on the, in favor of GMO direction myself. Uh, what was the, and um, what's an, is it star rice? that was GMO modified that had a vitamin that? So, yeah, so that's actually one of the, uh, an additional major discussion point, and it's in the, the USAID um, research agenda, not, I don't know whether it's in the, in the US, I think it is both, it's a, a US government research agenda, but um, the biofortification where you're, um, inserting or enhancing some capacity and the tools that are being applied, some of them are biotech tools to, uh, we have somebody in our department who has, um, you know, made orange corn and he sells it locally. You can even buy it on the shelf in various stores, Torbert's orange corn or whatever. And then if you feed that to chickens, you get chickens with orange egg yolks and they have a bit of a higher, um, uh, carotenoid, you know, density in it. And that's good in theory. That's a deficiency. But then there are other ways you can get that. And then the argument comes back to, okay, well, if, if you, if you need iron, is that the best way to get your iron or you need a micronutrient or is it actually uh, that, you know, uh, there's been extensive studies on the first a thousand days for children where they need they need animal products because they have the the proteins and there are very few substitutes if you say okay a child is just going to have a plant based diet you're you're that's in a pretty heavy lift to give that child enough protein. Hmm. All right. Well, thank you. It's an interesting discussion here. I, I could probably talk about this for quite a while, but uh, I think Betty had a kind of a follow up question she wanted to ask. I was thrown off by the banana question. I like bananas. <laughs> and a smoothie isn't a smoothie without a banana in it. Um, but I, you know, I'm a historian. My 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 silo is. Um, and so I I listened to the discussion on GMO because like everybody else out there, I on one hand, my daughter and her wife are scientists, they're with NIH, they're not agricultural scientists. But they're like, they're in the science part. They're like, you know, it's, it's created, it's possible, could do some good. Um, on the other hand, my food, my friends who are in the health and nutrition field, <gasps> like uh, the GMOs are the worst thing you can put in your mouth. Richard Luger, you might remember him, the wonderful esteemed senior statesman, senator of Indiana. He saw, he, hunger was a big concern of his. He saw GMO foods as a, a way to address yeah. hunger. And an important way at, with those micronutrients, as you're suggesting, and you know what's worse, just over taking the nutrients out of your your field because of bad growing or overgrowing or putting nutrients into your food. Let me ask you though, as a consumer, let's say when Claire wrote asked that shocking question of bananas going extinct and you said well other foods could go extinct too it's like oh my gracious what happens is science at the point where they could say well food science i should say well figure out another way to grow bananas we'll figure out another way to grow an orange we'll figure out you know people frequently think about oh my god i don't want an artificial lamb i want the real thing what do you mean make 
cows in a in a um, in a capsule. But is is does science have the ability to save the banana to grow to save the banana? I didn't know this was going to be a theme. I would have read up more on my banana. <laughs> well, that's just an example. This could be other food. No, so so um, from an from an ecological perspective, you know it. it the the pests and parasites that plague anything um it, it is a a constant from an ecological perspective this is a constant um uh no. change and be changed right so new diseases come oftentimes they're very very virulent when they first emerge we do things to figure out how to manage them and sometimes the diseases themselves become less less um virulent or less fatal um so for example COVID is actually less fatal i believe now than when it initially that's a very typical um uh, uh you know eventual evolution of a disease with its co-host humans it, a disease can't kill everybody because then it would have nobody left to kill um and it would just go away so um less virulent forms emerge because the two virulent ones just kill our host before they can transmit the disease. So species are always um, being assaulted by parasites that have gotten around the or, or diseases that have gotten around the latest defense. Uh, and then we are going back to the drawing board and trying to figure out, OK, how do we combat that disease? In general, I view it more as sort of, you know, don't expect to ever be done battling diseases. They're just organisms we don't want in our environment, but they're there and they're taking advantage of us. And so we should expect it to be an ongoing, you know, back and forth, a little bit of cycle with, with the things that we are trying to manage for and trying to manage against. I think the other question, the, the other side of the question was, science can probably help, you know, with those pesticides and th pests and things that come. Well, we can find something that will help minimize or reduce, if not the pest itself, the impact of the pest. My other question, the other side of the coin was, has food science figured out a way of, well, we can figure out a way to create that banana. Okay. <laughs> so now you're talking about lab created foods? Well, <laughs> maybe, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is good. <laughs> well, that's an interesting, uh, certainly there's a lot of investment going in, uh, in developing, you know, man-made products. Mostly they, they are derived from plant, plant products at some point, you know, they're, they're they have to come from somewhere. They don't just come out of the sky. Um, and so, you know, the building blocks, there's a lot making of fake meat that is derived from uh, plant-based products. Um, but then there's also lab created meat that, uh, what is the, 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 the building block, I think is something from eggs. And it's a generic building block to make foods of different types of foods. Um, Do you use meat protein as well? Yeah, I think so. I don't know. I was just listening to somebody talk about it the other the other day because they were talking about um, choice studies and whether consumers would choose such a product, which I think is really interesting. Um, it, you know, just in terms of the the yuck factor or the that's not natural factor, I wouldn't put that into my my body because it's lab created versus. She called the lab create a seed. I, I have yet to have plant-based meat I, for the yuck factor. I don't want to, but could could science create the seed from which that plant would grow? I'll, I'll just stop with that. Uh, possibly we're creating, I mean, what did we do? We created a buff a mammoth burger based on, I don't know how they did it out of the genetic material recovered from a mammoth skeleton. There's a lot of creating we can do because we understand the structure of the molecules and you can put them together, um, whether it's um, worth the, you know, from a life cycle perspective, whether it's worth 
the um, key, the resources that go into that versus letting Mother Nature grow that thing for you is a, a, also an interesting question. So mm -hmm. that that applies not to, to just lab created meats, but also to things like whether we should grow grow you know vertical farming. Um, that kind of thing, where we replace all the sunlight um, with, you know, high intensity LEDs that are relatively efficient. Still, there are inefficiencies in vertical farming, and you know, basically, you put a you put a seed out in the ground, and um, around here, that's all you need to do. Um, you can do a few other things, but you're still likely to get something produced out of that with a fairly minimal amount of effort in terms of whatever your resources. I'm a vertical farmer and I bet that there's probably somebody at Purdue, I would like to get over there and check out their vertical farming. Well, there's there's a lot of discussion about how, how deeply the university itself is going to invest in whether they're going to collaborate with the vertical farming entity to build a vertical farming facility on the edge of campus. So uh, maybe we can go back to kind of this global discussion of food availability a little bit more. Um, the, the reading suggested there were these tools for kind of predicting where trouble spots may arise. How effective are these in, in kind of your experience? And can we really use them to kind of mitigate uh, food problems, uh, famines, potential problems? Um, I, they're, they're, they can be extremely effective um you know both in terms of understanding the um or characterizing the extent of potential problem uh and you know typically they combine uh, an array of tools and technologies including remote sensed images from satellites um uh um, various data from markets and things like that and he, other human activities, um, or early observations of, of disease spread, that kind of thing. And all of these can be integrated and in AI, artificial intelligence can do it in a snap into telling you where your hotspots are. And I, I don't know if anybody saw, um, I think it was uh, uh, Sunday morning, CBS, um, 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 uh, what's her name, McCain, um, uh, John McCain's wife, who now runs the World Food Program, was on, and she was talking about, the, you know, they, they have a whole bunch of tools, and she's standing in front of this map of the world, and there are these, these spots, you know, blinking all different kinds of colors and, and highlighting the state of, the, uh, the expected state of, of hunger, how severe it is, timeline to the crisis, all that kind of thing. The tools work, but the, the challenge is getting people to act on the tools. Um, as, you know, whether people choose to act or not is often, you know, a multi-factor decision, and it includes things like um, whether or not where the crisis is occurring is receptive to the information that's coming from someplace else. Um, whether they're prepared to deal with the information, um, if they're not, you know, if they're if they're distracted completely by other more proximate crises in the moment, they're probably not going to spend a whole lot of time um, thinking about these, you know, early crises. I mean, it's unfortunate because the 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 way to to get out of at least a large number of these crises these that are where you you know move even into famine is to um, be on a pathway to prevent it way ahead of it happening so climate smart agricultural practices resilient systems marketing systems that can you know deal with the shock um and yet we tend to not think about or not invest in doing anything until the moment that the crisis is is real to us. In other words, pictures that help us with our emotions and, and distract us from our own day to day crises. And then, you know, everybody wants to do something and it's just too bad it didn't happen yesterday. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, right now, um, I had, you know, one last question I wanted to ask you, and we kind of talked about this earlier. Um, 
a lot of us participating in this program are concerned about famine and food insecurity, but uh, we don't really know what to do about it. And I was going to ask you, you know, if you had any suggestions, but I guess I would also like to ask our participants um, if they have some ideas about, you know, what things maybe they're doing already uh, that uh, might help uh, or just some thoughts that I might have. Uh, before we move on there, I noticed Sven had his hand yeah. up. First of all, good evening. Thank you for great discussion. I'm, uh, I'm Sven Schumacher and I'm a social worker. And if we have a big challenge in the community, would, we would very quickly ask what can the community do themselves? And that we, I, I get the sense when I'm thinking about all these things that we talked about it, these are all things that we can provide there to Africa or to these places. And I, I wonder what, what can people do there for themselves to help themselves. And I have had some exposure to amazing African, especially young people that are extremely well educated. Yeah. For several years, the Obama fellows came to, to our agency. And it was just amazing to see them. And they are so different than what many NGOs want to kind of show uh, what is, what's going on in Africa. It's all crisis and this and that and whatever. And I'm just a little worried about that all of these things seem to be that we discussed seem to be some kind of external great ideas for the people there. Uh, but what, what do you see have worked that, that people came up there in these countries themselves? Well, I think that's why the, the, um, I made comments around the fact that, that you can't just, you know, if you, if you see a problem from the outside and you think you have the solution, it's probably not the right solution. Um, you probably don't necessarily understand the problem and you don't necessarily understand how to empower, uh, empower the local community to deal with their problem. In the end, I think that's why, you know, while we're an educational institution, but we focus on capacity development because it, that's the goal, right? To develop the capacity if the capacity isn't there or to figure out what is needed and um, to, so, you know, Keen Adesinos um, uh, won the World Food Prize for the development of microcrediting uh, because cash was the limit, limiting factor. And in the end, it wasn't necessarily the need for huge gobs of external cash. It was the need for a microcrediting system that could be deployed so people could get little bits of credit to buy small bags of fertilizer to deal with or whatever it was they wanted to invest in to set up their small business. And so I think it's true that that where development often goes awry or development from external entities is that um, you think you have the solution. It's also why a lot of science um, never gets used. It's because it's not it's not the it, it, it goes through the valley of death where it doesn't get adapted to the local situation where it is appealing for the local community to use the science. The science is is um, is right sized and correctly oriented for the problem that that they perceive and their their understanding of the pathway forward. All right, well, thank you. Uh, Claire actually had an, another comment. Um, yeah, this is about bananas again. <laughs> um, when um, the bananas of my youth were a lot bigger than what we're seeing in the store now, um, we had this recipe for banana nut bread from the 1950s. It's been in my family and, and it's a wonderful recipe, but um, I uh, took a, a class in Latin American geography, and I think um, there were 18 species of bananas. I, I don't know how many I have sampled. I just get them from the grocery. <laughs> I'll taste the like, you know, but <laughs> they're different in size. And um, I joined Weight Watchers about 20 or so years ago. And I think with the popularity of the point system, because bananas were so big and had... Um, a high sugar content, they were two points, whereas most other fruits were one point. 
And that's when stores stopped carrying the really big bananas. They were just, you know, so the bananas we get today are a lot smaller than the ones that we got 20 or 25 years ago. And I was noticing that my banana nut bread recipe was kind of dry. <laughs> and then I, I went back to see what am I doing wrong? And I read it again. It says two large bananas and you can't buy large bananas anymore. So I use three bananas now <laughs> for my recipe. Well, as a scientist, I'll say you should always use, you know, recipes should be written in the metric system and a banana is in a metric unit. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so, just the demand of the people. They, they that's right. The the, no, products are, and, you know, there's a demand for aesthetically pre pleasing fruit. So then, you know, so what you see in the grocery store for fresh fruit uh, there's a, another pathway that goes into processing for things that doesn't that don't meet the aesthetic visual that we require when we're purchasing in the developed world. So I so follow up with my question about things we can do. Is it worthwhile for people to donate money to groups like Heifer International or World uh, World Kitchen? Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, I'm, I'm also. Um, an advocate of, you know, you have to um, do your homework on your organization, figure out, you know, the organizations, you know, make sure that you're satisfied with, you know, how they use the funds that, that are donated to them. Some have better profiles than others. That's often a, something that's tracked by various organizations. Um, I, I look for ones that, you know, I that not only feed people, but also consider the other aspects of, of the environment that we know are important. <laughs> um, thinking about, you know, that 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 food, energy, national security are all sort of interlinked. And so you're looking for, you know, uh, profiles that that are fulfilling to you. I mean, I think money money is is useful. You just want to make sure it's used appropriately. And it is more useful than just about unless unless you you know are are going to go do something or participate in an organization or volunteer. Um, the mo most useful thing you can give out of your house is money uh, or, or it's knowledge. You know your your uh, your knowledge, your money, um, and your uh, approach to other people are probably the things that are useful to give um, from from your home. <laughs> yeah. All right, Sylvie, thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, we're kind of at, towards the end here. I think we'll turn it back to Betty, and I think she's got a, maybe a comment as well. You took that no, as no, a comment. Uh, it was a real quick. We don't. I don't want you to go too much into depth because it is the end. I'm sure you mentioned we we talked a lot about the, the the plant itself and plant production and so forth and the GMO. You've talked also about the soy. When, when Claire was asking the question about the size of, but you, that could probably set about a lot of, of produce. Did you uh, talk quite a bit? I got some interrupting emails while I was here that I had to deal with while you were talking. Did you, did you mention about soil, the impact of soil and growth as well, Sylvia, so in your in, in your discussion? And, and Purdue's work, I imagine Purdue does a lot of work. Well, I do a lot of work in the area of, of soil and restoring degraded soils and what makes soils healthy. Um, and there's a lot of discussion about the role of, of healthy soils in climate adaptation and mitigation. Um, so I didn't say too much specifically about it, but a lot of the climate smart technologies um, are around soil management um, to enhance retention of nutrients, to enhance um, the soil's ability to hold moisture um and prevent water from running off and store it for use by a crop um things like and that I would, I would imagine that in i lived in africa for 11 years and and i lived overseas for 15 but it was more urban areas uh soil erosion uh, is a serious problem particularly where we were in southern africa things like soil erosion and when you've got really dense populations trying to grow things on smaller and smaller land availability um, soil will get exhausted from what, what we found, and I was working in, in the education sector, but our agricultural uh, people were just finding, you know, trying to get people to understand that 
you know, you can't talk about rotating crops and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> when people, this is the only land I have. It's not like- I Right, no, that's a huge, and some of the managements are, you know, the, the, there are trade-offs that are serious considerations. You know, you can't tell somebody, oh, you've got to leave the residues on your, on your field to help, you know, keep the soil in place when they need those residues for shelter or for fodder for animals. Right. Yeah. So it's a real challenge. Mm -hmm. I was asking about people from Africa. I am totally, I know that and even women are small scale business people who are agriculture. They're, they're very entrepreneurial. They're very savvy. They know what to do. It's the challenges that, that they have no control over, such as this is my only plot of land. Yeah, no, no, no. It's a very, and it's a very, so the, the fragmented land, the size of the, the whole. Of the animals who, yep. you know, um, <laughs> their cows are walking all over. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's a real challenge. Sylvie, thank you so much. This has been a fantastic program this evening. Um, and um, I, I learned a lot about food that got me going there and bananas. Thank you, Claire. <laughs> I'm gonna start worrying about bananas. I may start seeing if I could freeze a lot of bananas. I may get a freezer just for bananas. I don't wanna run out for my smoothies, but this was a great program. I think a lot of people really, we got into some things that we can, did not have to be a scientist to understand this evening's program. We all eat. <laughs> And I think that we do take a look at processed foods, how healthy are they? Um, I have yet to have one of those plant-based, what have you. I'm told they're delicious. I don't know. I'd rather, if I'm going to eat meat, let me eat meat. Um, and, I, and I have to laugh because they say, oh, this is great for a vegan. Well, vegans are vegans for a purpose. They're not looking for a you know, looks just like meat. Well, that's not what they're looking for. <laughs> they don't really want to eat a hamburger. I mean, that's okay. But thank you. It's been great. I want to remind you all again to please join us next week on Ireland. I think it'll be another fascinating. We have the um, uh, we have the the, the council from uh, the um, the council I count from council in Chicago. Um, who will be joining us. And that will be Pierre's program, Pierre Alice's program. He's always fascinating. He'll be interviewing that gentleman. Uh, and we'll be hearing a lot about that Easter Accord, or the Good Friday Accord, I should say. Um, but you again have to be registered. And then in two weeks, uh, Dr. Al Lopez, uh, Dr. George Lopez, the University of Notre Dame, the Croft uh, International Studies uh, Center, talking about economic warfare. So we're going to kind of end the year, our program year, and how we started it, talking about war and ending it on war. <laughs> and as we talked about tonight, food is sadly one of those byproducts of war, either used as a tool uh, in, uh, as a weapon in war, or one of the things that happens when people have to move and migrate quickly and uh, they become hunter hunter gatherers again, something we don't really exactly want very hard. But thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next week. You are a wonderful audience. Thank you and good night. And we'll see you as you gently leave our room. <laughs>